recording. Uh, I'm Rich Bidgood, a SCORE mentor, and uh, uh, with me is Matt Samley, who is a, uh, an attorney with uh, Apple Yoast. Uh, I am a retired banker, uh, and, and uh, so I will handle the cash flow portion of this, and, and Matt's going to do more of the legal side, but we'll talk about that. Before I do, let me do just a brief advertisement. Okay. Oh, my. Uh, SCORE, uh, just to remind you, is the organization sponsoring this. Uh, it's a national organization. And the important part is that we are here to help you be successful in your business. And in the Lancaster Lebanon chapter, there are about 70 volunteer mentors. And our, our goal is to help you be successful. So uh, there is the uh, link to score uh, if you need it. And if you don't have a mentor and you are a business person, I would encourage you to, to uh, um, contact them and contact us. Uh, again, I am uh, a retired banker. Uh, that's probably all we need to know uh, and have been around cash flow for a long time. Uh, Matt is a non-retired uh, uh, lawyer. Uh, and uh, looks at, among other things, bankruptcy and creditors' rights and debt issues. And so that's probably uh, all you need to know for the moment, and you can read the rest at your leisure. Let me start with a simple claim, uh, and that is that 2023 may be challenging. Um, for all the reasons that I listed here, just off the top of my head, COVID, uh, inflation, uh, and possibly recession, which are the most business-like issues, uh, and we are still pretty uncertain about how they're going to turn out. Fuel prices, labor costs, which you know about if you have employees, world events of all sorts. Uh, uh, and I guess we can add to that the fact that uh, our Congress will be spending the next few months trying to raise the debt ceiling for the United States, which uh, is almost uh, a guarantor of, of uh, turmoil. So we'll have that. Uh, maybe the only positive sign is that when I wrote this, I said January is cold and business is slow. I think it's 50 degrees outside. My flowers are coming up. Uh, and I hope business isn't slow. But I would still say there's a pretty high chance of the business environment uh, getting more difficult rather than easier in the months ahead. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I think we need to be prepared for that to be the case. Anytime uh, the business environment is uncertain, and again, I think it's going to be especially so this year, the best defense uh, against that is a strong cash flow. Obviously, cash is the oxygen that keeps a business breathing, it pays uh, the rent, utilities, payroll, it buys supplies and inventory. It is, uh, in brief, the thing that keeps the doors open. And so uh, most businesses, large and small, uh, uh, are, uh, if, if they're facing uncertain times, start to maximize their, their cash. Uh, I've heard a number of, of interviews with business people on the radio uh, over the past month, both large and small marketplace. If you listen to that on NPR, often talks to small businesses. And, and one of the things that you hear over and over again is people saying, I just don't know what's going to happen in 2023. And so I am accumulating cash to be, to be safe. So in the next 45 minutes or so, uh, um, we're going to talk about some basic steps to improve cash flow of businesses, and then some legal steps available if that cash flow is simply inadequate. Uh, you can think of it as a plan A and a plan B, if you'd like. Um, and then uh, we'll try to stay around for questions uh, if we have time uh, at the end. So let's begin then by taking a look at some basic steps to increase the cash in a business. And, and as we go through these, these are going to apply to a wide range of businesses. And so they might not all apply to you, uh, but I think there'll probably be uh, uh, a number that will, uh, and there probably should be at least one that does. 
So I'm going to look at several different uh, areas uh, to to generate more cash for your business. And and my goal in all of these, by the way, is to make them simple, uh, easy, straightforward, uh, not things that require years and years of analysis, because the whole point is we should be doing things now to generate cash. And so the first area that I want to look at is uh, shortening the sales to cash cycle. And by the sales to cash cycle, I mean simply uh, there are two real activities in a business. One is to make a sale and the second is to get paid for it. And uh, for those businesses that are uh, um, straightforward retail businesses where I come in and I buy a pair of socks and I give you cash, uh, that sales to cash cycle is instantaneous. Um, for those businesses that uh, either are con in the contracting businesses or bill out or have to wait for payment after they make a sale, that cycle can be days, weeks, or months. Uh, and so then it gets a little more complicated. So I want to focus on that first. And, and I'll start with billing. And here's a simple question for businesses who bill. Have you sent out bills to your customers? You say, that is so obvious. Why would you even ask that question? And I will tell you in my years of both banking and uh, with SCORE and, and being associated with other businesses, uh, the answer is sometimes, more often than you'd think, not yet. Uh, not yet because I'm too busy. I don't bill to the end of the month. Um, uh, nobody ever admits they forgot, but I had both a landscaper and an electrician uh, work at my house. And they said, we'll send you the bill. And I said, fine. And a month or so later, I contacted both of them and said, did you remember to bill me? And they each said, oh yeah, of course. And the next day I got the bills and that tells me they forgot to bill me. Uh, you wouldn't think that would happen, but it does. And consequently, even though they've made a sale, they don't have cash. So that's a simple question to ask, but it's but it's an important one. And, and uh, sometimes people just get too busy and they just don't get around to billing. And that should never happen because the cash needs to come into your business. You can ask yourself easily, can I bill more frequently? You don't have to wait till the end of the month. If you've done a big job uh, uh, and you can bill on a Tuesday afternoon, bill on a Tuesday afternoon. Uh, you can also, of course, progress bill uh, and, and you don't have to wait till the end of the job. Uh, I had some work done at our house and I got billed at the beginning and I got billed halfway through and I got billed at the end. Frankly, I think they could have billed me more frequently, but that's fine. Um, my favorite is my plumber who comes to my house, does work, and on the way out, hands me one of those little machines and I put my card into it. And so he has my cash before he gets back into his truck. So the point is that plumber has sped up the cash cycle. And so the faster that plumber, the faster the business can get cash in, the faster they're able to use that cash and have that cash available if there's a problem. They've built. Once they've billed, they have to collect those bills and that's a receivable. I would say uh, another way to shorten the cycle is keep track of big bills. Look at the bills that are out there for 30 or 60 days. Often businesses, again, will send the bills out, but then they won't pay a whole lot of attention to what's coming back in. That's your money. And so if it's late, pursue it. Uh, be the squeaky wheel. Uh, there's, no, there's no shame in that. It's your money say, why haven't you paid? Ask for it. You don't have to be nasty, but but keep pushing. And that's, uh, believe it or not, a lot of, of people and businesses pay bills by uh, uh, who annoys them most by calling. So call. If all else fails, and I've, I've been involved with businesses that, that they just can't get a collection on a receivable. If all else fails, get creative, get something, discount. Uh, can you pay me half? Can you make payment terms? Can you give me some collateral? Can you do something? Um, 
if that's your alternative to get the cash, then get the cash that way. Check in with Matt or your attorney before you do something like that. Uh, and they can give you some advice how not to get yourselves into trouble. But um, it's an alternative to not collecting at all. Finally, deposits uh, on this shortening sales cycle. Um, for those who do larger jobs, of course, asking for a deposit up front shortens the sales cycle because then you get the cash even before you uh, book the sale, as it were. So in terms of between selling and collecting, there are ways to shorten that cycle and get that cash into your pocket as quickly as possible because once it's in your pocket, then it's available to be reused or available to available to protect you in the case of a downturn. Look at a second area, uh, and that is waking up sleeping cash. Um, most businesses that I've ever been involved with have cash that's sleeping somewhere on the job. It's not doing what it should be doing. Uh, and then, so it becomes basically like an employee sleeping on the job. Inventory is a great uh, example, uh, and businesses that have inventory, if you look around, there's probably some in inventory that, that's not moving. It's stale. Uh, you, you, you bought those wide ties thinking they were going to be the fashion this year, and guess what? They're not. And so they're still in a box in the back. Well, that's cash. That's cash that you paid that's gone, and it's not doing anything for you. And so, uh, uh, you can look around for those, those pockets of inventory and figure out how to turn them back into cash. Um, special sales, um, two for one, whatever it is, uh, it may technically turn out to be a loss. You may sell it for less than you bought it for. But if that's the alternative to having it just sit on shelves in the back, uh, it's worthwhile. It may be worthwhile. Um, and, and so it turns it back into cash that you can use. Equipment or supplies. Uh, sometimes equipment is bought for a job that, that uh, is, there's some left over or supplies that you thought you needed that in fact you don't need anymore. Uh, again, that can be turned into cash. Uh, you may have seen an article last night that Twitter, which is now owned by uh, uh, Elon Musk, it has just turned over uh, a warehouse full of office equipment, chairs, tables, desks, coffee machines, games, et cetera, to an auction company. They don't need it anymore uh, and they would rather have the cash for it. So they've, in fact, you can, you can bid on that stuff if you need it. Um, um, they're turning it all over to an auction company. Equipment and supplies they don't need. Receivables we talked about, um, again, that's, that's uh, a receivable is, is cash that's sleeping on the job. It's an asset of the business, but you can't pay anybody with receivables. You have to turn it into cash uh, and so collect it. Space uh, may or may not apply, but, but some businesses have an extra space um, or have an extra building they aren't using or something of that sort. Uh, and, and that can sometimes be rented out. So the point is to get a little creative uh, and look at assets that the business has that got paid for with cash and should be turned back into cash so that you can use it as your business. I, uh, uh, I note at the bottom, there's sometimes emotion involved with this, uh, especially inventory. When I thought those wide ties were such a great idea and I spent, I paid a premium to get them and I got a lot of them because I knew they were going to be good. Dumping them now and turning them back into cash uh, sometimes admits that I made a mistake. Uh, and that's, so there's a little emotion involved in that and that can be hard. Uh, but you, you know, emotion doesn't pay bills. So you, that's something you just need to get past. And, and uh, if it's an opportunity, it's worthwhile taking. So we talked a little bit about shortening this cycle, collecting cash more quickly than, than uh, you might otherwise, uh, about uh, finding assets of the business that, that uh, should be cash, that, that haven't been turned into cash. And the third area I wanna look at is, is finding and plugging 
areas where cash is simply leaking out of the business. Um, and, and that can be in a number of areas, uh, expenses and services I lump together. Sometimes there are owner's perks uh, that are there in those expenses that aren't necessary. Sometimes there are various service contracts that, that were useful at some point, you're still paying them, but could either be eliminated or renegotiated. Uh, maybe you're renting more than you need. And when rent comes along to renew, you can shrink it down if you don't need it anymore. But it's worthwhile keeping an eye on those things uh, because expenses and services tend to grow rather than shrink. Advertising is an interesting uh, spot to look at in your business uh, because it's always hard to, to quantify exactly how much of a return you're getting on it. And so uh, it's, it's, it's probably necessary you need to do it, but, but you should also double check and make sure that, that uh, you're getting what you need for them. Vendors, again, if you haven't looked at vendors for a while, uh, whether they're uh, accountants or, or anybody else, it's, it's worth double checking. Uh, sometimes people love to pay their bills quickly. They take pride in paying their bills quickly, but, but uh, I wouldn't ever advocate somebody becoming delinquent in their, in their billing, but they might not need to pay them after 10 days. I want to spend a second talking about theft. Uh, this is a serious issue, and it's the biggest cash leak uh, potentially for a lot of businesses, whether it's scams, th employee theft, shrinkage from customers or suppliers, and, and cyber. Uh, many of the companies that I've been involved with or in uh, have been victims of these, especially cybercrime. Uh, you hear about it sometimes, I guarantee you it's happening a lot more than you know, because anybody who's subject to it tends not to advertise it. Uh, and so businesses around Lancaster, uh, if you gave me 10 minutes, I can name 20 of them, uh, that have been victims of, of theft and that's cash out the door. So it's, it's, uh, worthwhile as you think about improving your cash flow to think about tightening up your uh, um, um, operation in terms of theft of all sort. And by the way, I just saw this morning that Kim Stout, who uh, works for the Small Business Administration and is uh, one of our SCORE uh, partners, is doing a seminar on February 15th uh, um, uh, about uh, fraud prevention. Uh, and I think her link is on the, the score website. So that's an, that would be an interesting one to watch and relevant. So in terms of general strategy, I, I think now's the time to start building cash reserves. If you have the opportunity, start putting cash aside, either for uh, upcoming seasonal needs, which may happen all the time, or more importantly, for a downturn that may happen later in the year. That extra cash gives you a cushion to, to withstand that. It's worth spending time looking at it. Looking more broadly, but still on the cash strategy, thinking about your own business, you may ask if there are similar lines that you can be in that you could easily uh, expand your existing business without a large cash investment. I think of, of uh, a lot of restaurants discovered a takeout business during the pandemic, and that turned out to be a great business for a lot of them. Uh, I certainly take advantage of, of takeout and wind up eating from restaurants more than I used to, even if sometimes I, I carry it home. I know that can be a challenge because kitchens may not be able to uh, accommodate that volume, but it's certainly a related business that may not take a lot of, of extra uh, investment. But also, uh, adding repairs to sales or adding maintenance to installation, things that you already do that may uh, easily be expanded into a related business, increase your cash flow and so forth. Uh, and on the flip side of that, um, getting out of businesses that don't really provide or business lines that don't really provide much of a benefit for you. 
I would caution you about taking on uh, new debt in terms of expansion. Now may not be the time when you want to take on debt. Interest rates are going up. And of course, interest has to be paid. So that's a cash flow uh, drain. Projections can help here. And if you're really serious about uh, thinking along those lines, uh, talk to your SCORE mentor and, and look at doing some projections. We're talking about, really, we're talking about efficiency here. Uh, and, and we're talking about sp some specific acts that you can take, but also some ways to measure your own business. And this is a whole topic in itself, but I just want to briefly touch on uh, tracking your business. When I go to the doctors every year, we could do thousands and thousands of tests. Uh, but in fact, once my doctor listens to my heart and checks my weight and my blood pressure, we could be done. He can pretty much tell me then, yeah, you're healthy or or you need to do something to get your blood pressure down. And businesses are the same way. And we, we call those uh, quick, easy tests that indicate uh, your health key performance indicators. Uh, and there are key performance indicators for uh, specifically for types of businesses and so forth. But here are some general ones that are easy to calculate immediate. Uh, so we don't have to send away a test to, to see how much I weigh or what my blood pressure is. They, you can do these very quickly and immediately. They give you immediate feedback about how the business is doing and you can act on them. Uh, so gross profit margin, how profitable, profitable are my sales, those immediate sales. How rapidly does my inventory sell? You can do a quick calculation to see, do I have stale inventory sitting around? Ditto on receivables. How quickly am I collecting receivables? For retail operations, uh, what are my sales per square foot? And that lets, it's an easy calculation. It lets me know how healthy I'm, I'm being. Average spend for a customer. I used to be involved, excuse me, with a tourist business. They had plenty of people who would come. Uh, they wished they would stay longer and spend more. And so we started tracking average spend per customer. What did they spend when they were on the grounds? And once we started focusing on it, we could track it and so forth. So all of these help a business become more efficient, which means bringing in more cash. Uh, a whole topic in itself, but it's worthwhile finding two or three or four, not seven, not 20, uh, that you can that are meaningful for your business, that you can you can track consistently and frequently, and that can help you. So in summary, and I know this has been a quick run through, but in summary, be prepared for what could be a very difficult 2023. We don't know that it will. I hope it's not. But but you can't survive without adequate cash, and adequate cash is your best defense against economic difficulty. Now's the time to take steps to maximize it, not when uh, um, the economy turns uh south or when we really do become in a recession uh, and, and use KPIs, key performance indicators, to track your business and improve your cash flow. Um, so with that, uh, let's, so that's the plan A. You do these things and you're in great shape. Now let's turn to Matt, uh, who will look at remedies um, primarily from the legal perspective when cash just isn't adequate. Matt? Thank you, Rich. Appreciate it. Excellent presentation. Um, if my camera starts jumping around a little bit, I apologize. Not sure what's going on. Seems stable for the moment. Oh, there it goes. Not sure what's going on, but hopefully that won't be too much of a nuisance. Um, in any event, Rich, as he indicated, I'm a partner with Apple, Yoast, and Z. I'm also in the adjunct faculty of Harrisburg Area Community College, where I teach courses in contracts, better credit relations and, and small business. Um, as Rich noted, you know, managing cash and cash flow is critical to any business. And not all debt is bad. It really is how you properly manage it and leverage it um, to have your proper cash flow. And are you being proactive with managing debt? And that word being proactive, I think, is the, is the key here. Um, you want to 
use your attorney on the legal side in a proactive way before you run into problems. I once had a, my former partner, Dave Wagonseller, who's retired now, used to say, well, you know, attorneys really make their money because we're used reactively. You know, there's a problem. Help me, help me, help me. Uh, I'm stuck. And then, then they pay the big bucks. And that's when we make the big bucks. But really, uh, the small business owner should not be thinking that way. You know, and when you get involved with, with debt instruments and your lender, uh, are you having those reviewed? Do you understand what you're doing when you get into those types of transactions? And do you understand the ramifications if there's a problem with respect to those documents? And I always say how a small business owner manages his personal life with respect to debt will dictate what happens in business. The difference is, from a personal standpoint, you have much more protections under the law than you do in business. I mean, once you put that hat on and you say, I'm a small business owner, you've now graduated to a whole different set of laws and rules and regulations that don't offer the protections that you do, say, as a homeowner with a mortgage. You know, you're going to be signing promissory notes with things like what we call confession of judgment clauses and some uh, strict and I know Rich can appreciate this as an ex-banker, you know, some very stringent, um, you know, legal things can happen to you if you default with respect to that obligation. Um, so, again, that's all by way of background. But as we go through this presentation, again, I think the word proactive comes to mind. Think ahead. That helps you to manage that in a positive way. Again, not all debt is bad. It's what you do with it. So, Rich, let's look at the next slide. So the warning signs of financial distress. You know, what are we really talking about here? When do you know when the yellow and red alert lines are, are happening? And we'll go to the next slide. So most of you, if not all of you, understand the basic accounting formula, assets equal liabilities plus owners equity. You know, that is a fundamental balance sheet equation. How are we in balance there? Do the assets equate to what we have by way of debt, our liabilities, and do, is there owner's equity? But obviously, if we come to some point of insolvency, we have a problem. So what is insolvency? Next slide. Well, that's when your liabilities exceed your assets. That's the, what we call the bankruptcy test of insolvency. If you file for bankruptcy, and we'll talk about that a little later, we're looking at what is the amount of liabilities with respect to assets? And are you so leveraged, heavily in debt, that it leaves you very little room to balance that? Or are your assets declining in value? For example, are you a business with perishable inventory or other types of assets which are being depreciated? So it doesn't give you a lot of leverage with respect to your debt. And that also creates problems if you want to borrow money because banks are going to want to look to collateral that maintains or increases in value. And they're not going to, you're not going to be very bankable if you have problems with respect to, to solid assets. So that type of thing is what we look at. And if you're bordering on insolvency, then what are we going to do with respect to that type of analysis? But there's another test of insolvency. And we'll look at the next slide. There is a, a um, law called the Uniform Commercial Code, which applies in every state in this country. It is a uniform law, but every state has its own version of it. And this applies to sales of goods, secured transactions, where there's uh, personal property, which is secured by loans and so forth. And under the UCC definition, if a business cannot pay the debts as they become due or as they mature, that is also another test of insolvency. And again, it goes back to Rich was talking about by way of cash flow. Is your cash flow positive or is it declining? Are you able to service your debt? Are you able to service current debt? You know, things that you have to pay readily. What about long-term debt? How do we balance the nature of long-term debt versus short-term obligations? And this also look, uh, comes into play with respect to the types of debt one can have. 
secure debt, unsecured, and so forth. How do you give priority to certain types of debt? What is most important to pay? But if you're not able to pay your debts as they become due, you're going to have problems, and that gets you into a legal situation there. Lenders definitely look to what's going on with the business. Next slide, Rich. And one of the problems, and we do represent lenders, is that if there is a lack of communication with the lender, the lender doesn't know if the business owner is unable or unwilling to pay the debt. You need to keep the communication lines open as a small business owner. Uh, give them a heads up. Be proactive with your lender before it gets out of control. You know, lenders don't like foreclosure. They don't want to see their, their bars in default. So is there a way that you can work with your lender and manage that debt ahead of time before something catastrophic happens? But if you just simply don't communicate at all, the lender is going to assume the worst. They're going to assume that you're just simply unwilling to pay the debt and they're going to take drastic action and you're going to get a demand letter. You're going to have a default declared. You're going to see that then at that point, the lender is going to start tagging on extra costs and fees and so forth in collection. And it makes you very hard to negotiate with your lender on the defensive like that, because now you are in a reactive mode and you're not off to a good start with your lender. So again, Please keep your communication lines open. Next slide. I'm not going to go over this too much because Rich talked about it very much in his presentation. Again, money coming in has got to be greater than the money going out. Okay, that's what cash flow is. And we're talking positive cash flow. All right. So, again, always keep that in mind. You can look at other financial statements, balance sheet, profit and loss, and so forth, but cash flow statements are key to the success of a business in the long term. Next slide. Asset protection, another way of managing debt. How proactive are we with respect to, to uh, asset protection? And this is something you want to consider. When a small business owner is borrowing money, you know, typically the lender is going to seek uh, collateral. And that collateral is going to be assets which are reachable by the lender on foreclosure and so forth. The law gives certain protections with respect to certain types of assets. And a lot of this depends on how those assets are titled um, and so on. Uh, but again, as a business owner, there's really no business exemptions per se with respect to assets. A lot of the exemptions we find under the law are usually personal in nature. So for example, if someone were suing you personally, trying to seize your assets to satisfy a judgment, there may be some protected assets there by nature of, of the law. For example, retirement, um, certain household items, uh, clothing, uh, you name it. Pennsylvania doesn't give you a whole lot in this regard, but there are some things there. But from a business standpoint, there's really not a lot there that is exempt. So you want to look at that carefully. And some of it depends on how your assets are titled and how you're borrowing the money. So if you're the small business owner, let's say, and you set up a corporation, the business organizational form may help you, you know, because corporations and LLCs by their very nature have absolute immunity. You know, there's a separation of ownership and control. They're legal entities under the law. And what is titled in those entities' names is separate and apart from the individual business owners um, that own, say, the stock in the corporation. So that is part of asset protection. And one reason why you set up business entities is to manage that debt properly in case there would be a default or something like that. So again, being proactive, going into business setting up the proper organizational form may be a help. There's no absolute uh, cure for things, but again, those things might be very, very helpful. Certain other types of organizational forms, proprietorships, partnerships, and so forth, well, you have unlimited liability. So by their very nature, the business owners are not separate and apart from their organizational forms. The lender can look to any individual partner or the individual proprietor that runs that business, full liability with respect to that. Again, quite different than the corporation. Another thing to consider for asset protection and managing debt is titling property. Um, 
do you really need to set up a corporation? I always get, um, when I deal sometimes with, with other people looking at organizational forms, I always get people ch chanting the party line. I'll set up a corporation, uh, everything goes away. Don't have to worry about liability. Well, it's not always that easy for a number of reasons. One is banks aren't stupid. I mean, they're gonna require the individual owners to personally guarantee debt contractually, okay? So it's not gonna get you out from, from uh, some personal liability there if you're incorporating or you set up an LLC and so forth. However, the very nature of how you have property titled may be very helpful. So for example, if you are the small business owner and you're the proprietor, but you are married, and all of your property is jointly owned with your spouse. Well, under Pennsylvania law, it's not deemed that the husband owns that property or the wife, but the marriage does. It's like a third party owning that property. It would be as if the lender would have to go after a third party to, to uh, collect on the debt. And they can't do that. I mean, unless they're, again, looking toward personal guarantees with respect to that loan or whatever of the spouse and so forth. But sometimes the practical nature of how property is owned personally or otherwise may affect the risk that the individual has with respect to that debt. And you want to look at that very, very carefully. You may not need to incorporate or, or proceed with some more formal organizational form based on how property is titled from a debt standpoint. You have to look at it. But again, watch contractual liability because that's very, very important. Um, if you are personally signing things, whether it be a lease or a loan agreement, you know, I just ran into a situation with a client that uh, the business is the tenant, but they also individually had signed the lease uh, binding themselves to the landlord if there would be any problem with respect to the tenancy. And that acted as somewhat of a, of a guarantee. Well, then you've just opened the door with respect to that. The other thing too is prioritize debt, secured, unsecured, okay? Obviously things like secured debt, there's much more risk than unsecured debt, like credit card debt. Secured debt, there's collateral for it. Also watch tax obligations, okay, and so forth. Um, if you have tax obligations, those debts should really be given priority. If you owe the IRS money or the Pennsylvania Department of Revenue for back sales taxes, um, the taxing authority has a lot of power to lien property with blanket liens very quickly and seize that property and those are the types of debts, if you're having trouble, if you're having cash flow problems and you're having debt problems, you probably want to prioritize your tax debt first and then look to secure it and then unsecure debt. Because once you get the taxing authority after you, it can be a problem, okay? Especially on the state level. Not even so much the IRS necessarily, but the state level, just because they can possibly look to the business owner himself um, even if you have an entity set up with respect to some liability there. So again, they, they have broad powers with respect to collection and so forth. Next slide. Watch out for what we call in the law fraudulent transfers. Um, it doesn't mean necessarily you intended the fraud, but what we're talking about is if you owe creditors money and you are transferring title to assets, for less than fair consideration, the law considers that a fraudulent transfer and it allows the creditor to void out that transfer, put title back in the small business owner's name and seize those assets. So some think, oh, I'm having debt problems. I'm just going to transfer all my assets and retitle them in the name of a third party, my spouse, my kids, my friends, uh, set up another business entity. Well, it doesn't work that that easily, believe me. And there is a look back period. And usually under the law, anything at least up to a year, possibly two years, could be looked at as a fraudulent transfer if you're, if you're insolvent, if you owe creditors money, and you're transferring that property for less than fair consideration. There, you know, then the transfer is voided out. So that's one thing you want to keep in mind in managing your debt. Next slide. 
fundamentals of workouts and bankruptcy law. So if you get to the point where you can't really plan so much, that we're not being able to plan with respect to our transactions, our asset protection, titling of assets, and so forth, and we really do run into a problem with our lender or a creditor, then what do we do? Well, one way of managing that debt on the back end is to do a workout with that creditor and possibly even bankruptcy. Bankruptcy doesn't mean necessarily you're packing up shop and going out of business. Sometimes creditors actually like bankruptcy if you're reorganizing because it allows that cash flow to be put into the bankruptcy so the creditor gets paid. And it's something to consider. So let's look at the next slide, which is workouts. I always say when you're working out something with a lender, you really got to give the lender an incentive to deal. If you're going to propose something, you know, why would the lender take an interest in what you're doing here? And, you know, what is the business owner's objectives? What is the lender's objectives? Do we have a conflict with, with that? Or can we, do we want to continue the relationship with lender and business owner. So that's something to keep in mind. You know, is it something that as part of a business owner, we can release a guarantee based on certain circumstances and maybe continue to operate the business? Um, or is the lender going to be insisting the other th way of, of getting more collateral or more uh, guarantors uh, involved with respect to the to the uh, deal. Well, you have to look at that. You know, obviously there's a, again, there's a, a dichotomy of interest there between the lender and the business owner. <clears throat> what about a private sale of assets? Does the business owner want to get out of business, sell its inventory, sell its equipment? Will the lender allow a private sale? And uh, trust the business owner's judgment as to the nature of handling that process. Now, usually the lender is going to want to appraise those assets to make sure a fair value could be received at sale. But maybe if you, know, if you as a business owner control the nature of that sale, it might be something to consider there. But again, you want to, as a business owner, try to make it easy for the lender. Lenders do not like foreclosure. Lenders do not want to come in and, and just start seizing assets and, and shutting business owners down. And if the business owner truly wants to um, and has made a decision that it's time to close the doors, then maybe you can do it on the business owner's terms, maximize value for all concerned, and then eliminate as much risk as possible. So workouts can, can be very, very effective if you have a lender that is willing to entertain uh, what is being presented by the business owner. And again, depending on the goals of the business owner and the lender, you know, it might be something to consider to avoid formal proceedings by the lender against the business owner, because once that happens and a foreclosure takes place, it leaves the business owner very little room to negotiate. Uh, the lender takes control of the process. The lender doesn't always maximize value. And then the business owner is stuck with a large, may, albeit maybe an unsecured debt after the collateral is repossessed, but it, it can be a problem. Next slide. So I know we are in very limited time, but another way of managing, again, uh, a debt is through the federal bankruptcy law. Uh, bankruptcy is a federal legal mm -hmm. process. And the goal of any bankruptcy is to grant a discharge to the debtor, okay? Now, discharges apply to individual debtors, like sole proprietors. Corporations and LLCs that file for bankruptcy do not get discharges. It's a process, however, to wind up the, the business entity and pay creditors to the extent that there are assets available. But bankruptcy, again, can also be used for many business owners that want to stay in business and reorganize. And really what you're doing there is you're reorganizing the right side of the balance sheet. So remember the accounting formula, assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity. You're really through a bankruptcy reorganization, rewriting the nature of the debt, the liabilities, and how you're going to pay that, and also the equity going into the business. Okay. Um, 
And it allows the business to continue without being bogged down with debt. Okay. Again, the goal is to give the, the business owner a fresh start and keep the business operating. Uh, it's a band-aid of sorts. Uh, so it gets you over the hump. And then, you know, post-petition, the business owner has to keep, keep operating. But it also frees up cash flow. And that allows the bankruptcy debtor to continue. So what are the key concepts of any bankruptcy? Well, most importantly, the petition filing date. Because once the petition is filed in bankruptcy and the debtor says, I need, I want bankruptcy relief, then there's a doctrine called the automatic stay that comes into play. It gives the debtor, the business owner, breathing room. And this is whether the the business owner is liquidating or whether they're reorganizing. The automatic stay is an automatic injunction. The debtor doesn't have to ask for it. It happens automatically on the petition filing date. So the lender cannot come in and foreclose, can't demand and proceed with collection, can't seize assets, can't do any of that until the debtor has a chance to try to reorganize. So that's probably the most important concept in bankruptcy law is the automatic stay. The automatic stay applies to what we call property of the bankruptcy estate, and it allows those business assets and so forth to be protected from seizure during the pendency of a bankruptcy reorganization. It allows the debtor to revamp its debt, to remanage its cash flow, and become more profitable out the other side. The debtor business owner also has the ability to redo some of its leases and what we call executory or ongoing contracts it may have with suppliers and vendors and, and uh, even customers. And it can decide to reject those contracts and leases which are unprof- or not profitable and accept others and continue others that are profitable, streamlining operations, and again, free the debtor from those those devices that perhaps cause some of its financial difficulty. Exemptions, key concept in bankruptcy, but exemptions generally apply to individual debtors. Okay. There are certain business exemptions for for sole proprietors and, and others that operate very small businesses that allow one to keep certain property. Uh, outside of liquidation. Exemptions are really a concept that primarily deal with liquidated uh, bars. So those that are going out of business, what can you get out of bankruptcy? And the bankruptcy code will allow certain uh, classifications of property up to a certain dollar amount to be kept as exempt property free from credit. Chapter 7, 13, and 11, just in a nutshell, chapter 7 is a liquidation debtor, business owner, going out of business. Chapter 13 applies to individuals who are reorganizing or individual uh, sole proprietors that are reorganizing. Uh, It's like a mini chapter 11, and it applies up to a certain amount of debt, uh, both secured and unsecured debt. And if you fit in the guidelines, you can reorganize much more expeditiously than going through a formal chapter 11 process. If you are a large debtor, a corporation, LLC, or something, you generally have to file Chapter 11. That is a detailed reorganization where you have to propose a bankruptcy plan to pay back creditors uh, to to the extent you are able over a period of time. And that basically deals with past debt. So bankruptcy always deals with past debt, pre-petition debt. You are responsible for post-petition debt. The idea is to get the baggage behind you, restructure your debt, proceed forward at that point, and continue hopefully more profitable. Now, most debtors that go through reorganization, unfortunately, or a good portion of them, it doesn't work out. They can't get a plan confirmed. Uh, There's problems there. The business is suffering during this process. It is an expensive process. I mean, Chapter 11 is not cheap. Just in the administrative costs alone between the attorneys, the trustees, everybody else involved with some of this stuff, it gets very, very expensive. Plus, you not only have to worry about trying to pay back some prior debt, but you have to keep up with your future debt at the same time. 
Are you able to do that? You have to plan ahead. You have to do some strategic planning in there, see if it works. But if it is successful, it is a great tool. And it's something that can be uh, utilized um, to, the, to the business owner's advantage. So again, bankruptcy isn't all bad necessarily. It might be the last alternative, but it may be the only alternative. And it's something to consider if there's no way else to manage that debt. So that's about the extent of my presentation. Great, Matt. Thank you. That was informative and, and clear. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I think we're still a little bit under the hour. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing. Well, maybe I'm going to stop sharing. And if we have questions or, or thoughts or comments. Uh, the chat box is respond. open if you want to use the chat box to the uh, attendees. Or you can use the Q&A box. Or shout. <laughs> you can do it orally. Because we're going to give an exam in the next two minutes on everything we covered. So you have to pass it to get off of Zoom. Jim, you usually ask a, a question. Where's Jim out there? Well, I learned a lot uh, from the two presentations. I had a small bit. There is there is a, a question in the chat box. Uh, copies of the presentation, Tom asks. Uh, um, I, I can answer that. The recording will be on the SCORE YouTube channel in about uh, a week and a half. Yeah, and and I have no objection to sending out the slide deck from no. Matt, are you okay with that? Yeah, if, I'm, if I'm anybody fine. Wants the slide deck. Sure. We'd be happy to share that. Yeah, I don't know quite how we do that, but. Well, if you want a copy of the slide deck, I suggest you put your email in the chat box. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, let me, uh, and you you mentioned that that uh, for our contact, uh, let me in the chat, I'll put my email and phone. Okay. And I'll, I'll do that. I'll just put that Samley in my email and so on. Um, And I'll I, do the same thing. And I'll send that out. Super. Great. Good, good idea. Matt, you mentioned about future debt following a bankruptcy, and hopefully nobody has to go through all that. But as a former banker, one key also is there's no obligation for a banker to provide future debt. That's to somebody right. who has been through bankruptcy. <laughs> That's exactly right. And, and you know, not to get into the weeds, but, you know, you, you look for those cash collateral orders and things on the first day of the chapter 11, but there's no guarantee. You've got to really give the bank an incentive to deal post-petition. But, you know, I will also say as a former banker, and you started talking about communication, I have watched bankruptcies and near bankruptcies go in two very different directions. And one of the key determinants of that is that client who calls their banker and says, I'm having a problem. Yeah. Here's what I plan on doing about it, but I got to tell you, I'm having a problem. Yeah. And you know, I hope you'll work with me, but here is my plan. And it builds that trust. And I have been in, involved in some large, almost bankruptcies where the bank never took a hands off because we can't do that. But where we really said, we're behind you on this one. Yeah. We're following you on this because we think we're going to have a better result. That's how much we trust you. We think yeah. we're going to have a better result. If you drive this bus and we're in the passenger seat, uh, we'll be backseat drivers, but, but, but you drive it rather than we drive it. Yeah. And, and then it starts yeah. with that communication, that communication. It's a good point, Rich. And in fact, I'm dealing with a client now who many, many months ahead of time, they uh, 
um, they notified the bank and they said, look, we're going into a rough season. We see where things are going and we need to discuss some things here. And the bank uh, a year later has still been working with this business owner. Uh, I've never seen such uh, cooperation, but it shows it can exist. Yeah, and absolutely. They're, they're, and you know what? Things are working out. You know, yeah. that mutual trust and help. It, yeah. it, but it's the business it, owner that often drives that. Jim Brenner has asked a question, is it usually, and you touched on this a little bit, Matt, is it usually a good idea for a business to have an LLC? That may be a little broader question than yeah. you know, in the time. But, but LLCs are, are generally the, the entity of choice. Uh, but one thing you have to watch is uh, under Pennsylvania laws with many states, if you're a, a single member LLC, um, those protections are somewhat limited because if there are any distributions out of the LLC, then they can be subject to a charging order by the creditor to basically garnish to pay debt. So they are useful. Uh, I think it's kind of a no brainer to, to form an LLC, even if you're a, a single member individual doing that uh, rather than just operating with a proprietorship. The only exception to that is how long term is the business going to be? Because I always say when you're forming corporations and LLCs, it's like giving birth to a baby. And once you got kids, you're going to have them. And it's a lot harder to shut down a business entity than to form it. There's a whole process involved. So if you think you're going to try it on for size, see how your business is going to work, well, maybe you want to start simply and then see where it goes from there. So, you know, managing debt is only one consideration on business formation entity, but there are, you know, there are other ones like, you know, is there going to be continuity of life? How long do we want this thing? Because you might be forming something, then you're going to have a, it's going to be with you. <laughs> you got to deal with it. So. Apologize for this camera. I'm not sure what's going on here. But... Any other comments or questions? Well, for those of you left, maybe there are more coming, but but in the meantime, we really appreciate you uh, um, sticking with us and listening to us, and we hope you found some things that were helpful. Yes, thank you everybody.